Please welcome Katie Glover. Okay. Thank you. You're so excited. Um, all right, so can you guys at the back hear me? We've had a debate over whether I should use the microphone, but I think my voice is loud enough and I like to move around. So can you guys hear me comfortably back there? Yes? Wait, anybody not? <clears throat> was that a no? That was a yes. Okay, cool. Um, what Tyler or Professor Stillman neglected to mention is Tyler and I have known each other our entire lives. Um, I actually don't remember not knowing Tyler. And so the very fact that he would ask me here and trust me, knowing what I know about Tyler as a youngster and a teenager and a 20 something, that he would trust that I would stand up here in front of a bunch of people who have to respect him and that I wouldn't say anything just is really, really flattering. So thank you, Tyler. But I will tell you, just as a gift to all of you and as a sort of like, long game prank for me, if you want to write down the word scary treehouse, just write it down and then hassle Professor Stillman until he tells you what that means. You won't be able to figure it out on your own. You're going to need to hassle him. But just as a little treat for me, he's going to have to try to figure out how to explain that to you guys in a way that uh, doesn't embarrass him too much. So if you want to write that down, scary treehouse. I will know that there's a little bit of a chance that he's going to be embarrassed at some point in the future, and I don't have to do it now while he's sitting here watching me. So I actually really love Tyler. His whole family is quite wonderful, and I'm very flattered that he asked me to come, not so that I could embarrass him, but because I had a wonderful experience here at SUU. It was definitely the foundation of everything that's come since, and so I love to come back. I feel very excited that Tyler felt like I had something that might be of interest to you guys. So, um, I don't know why I'm carrying this Starbucks thing around. I will put that down like a professional. Um, but I have some things that I want to share with you guys today. Just a few sort of, uh, of things that I've gleaned in 20 years of working that I think would be helpful. But I want to preface this by saying that no one actually knows anything. So as you are starting out your lives and your careers and people are just bombarding you with advice and telling you what you have to be like and what you have to do and what you have to learn and where you have to go and what kind of experiences you have to have, I'm just going to tell you that there are as many paths to success as there are people who have experienced success. And if you were going to find, just put your bets on a person who is going to have a long successful career in the male dominated sports industry, I promise you that it wouldn't have been the scaredy cat worry wart theater girl in Salt Lake City, Utah, who was being raised to be a mom, who was going to be that girl. So I just right out of the gates want to tell you guys to be really careful about the advice that you take and the things that you think you have to change about yourself in order to be successful because you really don't. You can really just be yourself and you can go your own path and you can figure things out as you go. And even if you can't see the person that's in the place you want to be, I honestly as a teenager did not know women with jobs. They were teachers or they were moms. I didn't know any women who had full-time executive jobs. I didn't know any. And that's what I wanted to do for whatever reason. That was what came into my little head. And that's where I ended up. So you don't have to see it to be it. It's great that there's more representation now, but you really can do whatever you want and you can do it as yourself. So before I give you a whole bunch of advice, I just want to make sure that you understand. Listen to what I have to say. Listen to what other, your other professors have to say. Take in lots of information, but like spit out whatever feels like it doesn't work for you. So that's my caveat before I now give you a bunch of advice about what you need to do to be successful. So, the first sort of lesson that I learned started right here at SUU, and I just stopped by my little apartment in College View that I lived in when I first came, and I remember my parents dropping me off. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a bank account. We had no money. I was here on Pell Grants, and they drove away, and I didn't know anybody. I came down from Salt Lake purposely to a place where I wasn't going to know anybody and that instantly felt like a huge mistake and I walked back into my dumb little basement apartment and was like so what do I do and I rode my little bicycle up to Lynn's and bought a whole bunch of cold cereal that my mom never allowed us to have and had that for dinner and that felt pretty good and then proceeded to just have a miserable first quarter here I just 
hated it. I was one of those kids that everyone told me, college will be better for you. You'll have so much more fun in college. And I came down here ready to take <laughs> over the world. And this world did not want to be taken over by me. I made two little friends at the very beginning and then they joined a sorority and I never saw them again. There was one girl that I'd gone to church with who's met her now husband the second day and I never saw her again. My roommates were very strange and not on my wavelength. Uh, the first, first day I was playing a Pearl Jam CD in my bedroom and my roommate walked in and was like, what's this? And I said, it's Pearl Jam. And she was like, who? And I thought, I am not, these are, this is not gonna go well for me here. So miserable time. I didn't like my classes. I was a theater major for five minutes and then was like, this is not where I wanna be. Um, I volunteered for um, st a student election committee because those were starting to form. And the kid who was running for president could not remember my name. Every single time I came to his stupid meetings, he'd be like, I know I should know you. So that felt really good as a freshman to be like, oh, this guy doesn't even remember my name. And he was like a cool, popular guy, which parenthetically, he and I are having breakfast on Saturday because we are now really good friends. So just uh, sort of <laughs> foreshadowing, it turned out okay. Um, so I hated it and I went home for Christmas and I told my parents, I'm not going back there. I don't like it and I think I should just stay here and go to the University of Utah like everybody else is doing. And my parents, who were way wiser than I was, did not say you have to go back. They were like, okay, that's, I mean, if you don't want to go back, you don't have to go back. So I spent the first week of the new semester in Salt Lake. I had all these little brothers and sisters and they were all over the place in my business. And I had gotten a little taste of what it was like to just sort of run your own life. And I started thinking, huh, was it so bad down there? Is <laughs> it really so terrible? Um, and I had one friend who, and this, let's just remember, this was 1994, there was no email, there were no cell phones. You had to work really hard to like reach out to somebody. So she called me at my house on my family's phone line to see if I was coming back. And that's all it took was like one little connection reaching out and saying, hey, we miss you down here. So I came back and without making it sound like it was a miracle, honestly, like everything shifted suddenly. Derek remembered my name in the committee meetings and I started to meet people and I joined a sorority and just things really blossomed. And I realized that this was a place where I could do anything I wanted. And I worked on the, the university journal and I had a radio show for a while and I did student government and all sorts of amazing fun things here, which you guys all know you have access to at this place. And I had an amazing experience and I met people who I still count as some of my very best friends. When I was posting that I was coming down here, every, I was getting all these emails like, oh, I so wish you would come see you. Like just so many people still in my life from that time. Mindy, how do you know me? I'm yeah, see, <laughs> 25 years ago. Still, still people that, uh, that I'm hanging on to. Hey, Janet, how do you know me? Uh, 2002 Olympics. There we go. See, hang on to people. We're going to get to that. <laughs> um, so I ended up having a really great experience. But the thing that I learned when I was having that sort of this thing, this experience is the worst and I don't want to go back, is an understanding when I did come back and it was OK that Situations are not permanent. And just because something feels hard for you doesn't mean it's not right for you. And that's something that I've had to learn over and over and over. I've moved across the country four times. I've started new jobs. I've been traveled all over the world all by myself. And a lot of times it's felt really scary and like I was making a huge mistake. And it's never, ever, not once been a huge mistake, but it's never, ever, not once not felt scary. So. If I could tell you one thing about big, hard experiences, it's you're probably just on the precipice of something really, really great when it feels really, really hard and really, really scary. And when you guys graduate, 100% you're gonna experience some terrifying situations that feel really, really wrong. Whether it's a first job or a new city that you move to or a relationship that you get into, it's gonna feel really wrong. And I promise you, almost without question, that means something good is just around the corner. And that's definitely what I experienced here and what a few of the other experiences that I'm going to tell you about started out as big mistakes that really turned out to be pretty awesome. So SUU ended up being a place where I met a lot of really great people. Um, then I graduated in 98. I went to Switzerland for a couple years for my church and then I came back and I'm going to run you guys through sort of my career history. And I want to see if you can kind of pick out a pattern 
as uh, we go through my jobs of how I got the jobs that I got. So just pay attention to sort of what, what knits these all together. So I come back from Switzerland. It's like January of 2000. And this ad agency that I had worked with when I was in college offered me a job, which was super cool. They, did, they made video games for Sony. It was a rad agency. It was going to be a cool experience in advertising, which was what I majored in, which doesn't always happen. So I was super excited. But I also knew that they were starting to hire people for the Olympics in 2002 that were being held in Salt Lake. And it just seemed like a once in a lifetime opportunity. And if there's one thing I really love, it's a big to do. And the Olympics seemed like the biggest to do that would ever happen in my city. So I started kind of poking around, like maybe I could get a job there. It seems a little bit out of my reach, but potentially. And I found out that my friend Tosh Brinkerhoff, who'd been student body president here at SUU, and I'd worked with him on a student activities board, was working for the Olympic Committee. So again, email is very new. I wrote Tosh a letter that I mailed to the Olympic team, to the Olympic Committee. And he just said, hey, I don't know if you remember me which is always my opening line, even though he totally should have remembered me. Um, but I'm back from my mission and I'm interested in this. And, you know, I did student activities and I'm sure I'm qualified for any job you guys have available, which is definitely the attitude you should have when you go out into the world. And Tosh wrote me back and was like, hey, dummy, I totally remember you. You dyed my hair in a hotel room in uh, Moab once. So I, I remember who you are. And <laughs> It was a really good memory. He was such a like, straight-laced guy, and we got him to dye his hair. It was so fun. Anyway, so Tosh was like, I totally remember you. And there happens to be this opening for an administrative assistant with the short track speed skating and figure skating team. I did not know at the time that administrative assistant was the new word for secretary, but it still seemed like a great opportunity. So I came in, I interviewed, I got the job. Uh, this amazing job that set a real unrealistic bar for what a career was going to be like because I got to work directly with athletes on the field of play at the Winter Olympics and it was the cr most crazy fun job ever. Met super interesting people, got to work with all these really fun athletes and our building was um, it was called the Delta Center at the time. Now it's the Vivint Arena where the Utah Jazz play. And we were just like the place to be during those Olympics. We had a figure skating judging scandal that happened that was super fun. We had a lot of blood on the ice when all the athletes went down and the guy in last place won the gold medal. Uh, we had some breakout stars, Apollo Ono, who now is like an old celebrity, but was a new one back then, was in our building. So it was just like wild and fun. I've never worked so hard. I've never slept so little. I have slept on the floor of Vivint Arena and showered in the jazz locker rooms at one point because we just couldn't go home. It was just a wildly fun, amazing job. But uh, the Olympics end and then you don't have a job anymore. So I found myself at 25 with having had the most amazing experience of my life and also like I don't have any idea what to do next because now I'm not working in advertising anymore. I'm kind of working in event planning and I could not spend one more second in Salt Lake City, Utah. I had to get out. I just wanted to go somewhere and spread my wings a little bit. So I did what they told me to do when I was here, how to get a job. I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll network. That's what I'll do. So I had this uh, woman who was, she was our building manager at Vivint, and she was on leave from Reebok, where she had been the global marketing director of sports marketing. So that tells you how good she was that they let her go and come back and that they, we wanted her so badly that we asked for her to go and come back. She was amazing and just became a really cool mentor. So I took her out to breakfast. I had $0.0, .0 in my bank account and I took Cecilia to breakfast. And I just said, tell me, like, how did you get to where you are? Just walk me through the steps that you took. So we had this great breakfast. She kind of gave me a little bit of advice. It was like sports apparel is a fun arena to get into. So maybe kind of look there. So I left that breakfast thinking, okay, I've got like some good direction to go in. And I got on monster.com, which I don't even know if that exists anymore, but that's where you looked for jobs back then. And I just couldn't find anything. And then maybe three or four days later, Cecilia calls me and says, hey, I have this friend. She works for this little sports brand in Boston. She's looking for a field rep in LA. And I told her you'd call her. So I bet you can guess what happened. I called Catherine, I got that job. And about a week later, I was driving out to LA with all of my worldly possessions asleep on a friend's couch until I found a place to live. And I started working for this little women's athletic shoe company called Rika. 
and they had events all over the country. I got to travel like crazy. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Lady Foot Lockers and Dick Sporting Goods teaching 22 year olds how to sell my shoes. Um, and it was really, really, I, I got to work on the marketing side. They moved me out to Boston at one point, then moved me back to California. Um, and in sort of the pinnacle moment of that time, we decided to get a celebrity uh, endorsement or celebrity spokeswoman, which was really new for our brand. And um, me, my boss, and our product manager got in a little room with Kelly Ripa and her husband, who was at the time very white hot A-list celebrity. And we presented a plan and said, come join us. And Kelly Ripa said yes to us, which was <laughs> really shocking. I, went to the bathroom after the presentation it was like hyperventilating in the stall and i came out and kelly was washing her hands and i was like Ugh, just kelly and i in the bathroom here and she said i just have to tell you like i've heard so many pitches in my career like everyone wants me and i've never heard one as good as the one i just heard right there and i thought i was gonna pass out in the bathroom i'm like how will my life ever get better than right now in this bathroom in new york city with kelly ripa um, so we signed Kelly and it was so exciting, but a little part of me was like, oh, okay, I can stay here and I can manage this campaign or I can try to maybe look around a little bit. So at the time when I was working at Rika, I met this couple, they were super cool. She was a, a footwear designer for us and he was working at Reebok at the time in a marketing position. And they introduced me to um, a headhunter, a, a recruiter who only worked with sort of high-end brands and uh, they thought that I was at that point in my career where I could kind of connect with her. And they said, she'll kind of look for jobs for you and she'll come to you with really good opportunities. So I was really flattered that they thought that that was somebody who would want to take me on. And I talked to her and she was like, yeah, I definitely want you in my pool. So I told her that my only requirement is I never want to live in Boston again, ever, ever, ever. But other than that, like come to me with anything else that you find. So I bet you can guess when she called me what she had. She had an opportunity in Boston. And she said, I know you told me to never call you with an opportunity in Boston, but I have one and it makes a lot more money than you're making now. And it's this little brand called Tree Torn and they're owned by Puma. And you would report in directly to the chief marketing officer of Puma. So interestingly, I had read an article in Fast Company about that chief marketing officer. And he was kind of a little celebrity in the, in the marketing world. He'd become the chief marketing officer of Puma when he was like 25. He was really cool. He's like a little skate rat that this, the, the um, president of Puma had found in a skate shop in Boston. And he was smart and he was rad. And he kind of led Puma into this real renaissance of going from being like last place in the footwear world to really competing with Nike and Adidas. And I had told myself when I read that article, if I ever get a chance to work for Tony Bertone, I will totally take it. So when she said you'd report directly to Tony, I was like, oh, I don't want to go to Boston. I live in Huntington Beach and it's perfect, but I will pack up my things in January and I will drive across the country to stupid Boston where it's freezing and I will take this job. And it was miserable. I did not like it. Um, I was right. I did not like living in Boston again. It was very cold. But also the job just wasn't right for me. It was a, a leisure brand and I just miss sports a lot. So it was great to work for Tony. He was super, super visionary, but also very mercur mercurial, which is the word I love. He just was all over the place and it was hard to pin him down. And he just was a little bit more um, crazy than I thought he was going to be. So I was pretty miserable. I remember standing at a trade show in Barcelona and watching these supermodels walk by on stilts. And I was like, I am in the wrong place. This is not the job for me. And I just was like a little wilting flower. And one day, one of my coworkers called me into his office and he was like, you hate your job, don't you? And I said, I really, really do. And he said, well, you're in luck because Sabrina, who manages golf, also hates her job. And I think you two should just switch jobs, which I don't want to get your hopes up. Companies don't always take care of you like this, but they knew they had two little superstars who were just really wilting. And that if maybe they switch jobs, they might both thrive again. So we both picked up our little boxes and we, I walked over to the Puma side and she walked over to the tree torn side. And within like days, we were both so much happier. I was so happy to be working in sports again. I was so happy to kind of be back in athletic wear and just feeling like I was like myself again. And right about that time was when we were starting to pick athletes for the next year. And we just happened to start talking to this kid from Oklahoma State University who was ready to go pro. And for 
a bunch of reasons that I will always be grateful for, Nike was off the table for him. They just couldn't touch him. They had some reasons that he would, would never sign with them. So he was like in play for everybody else who had a golf line. And we started talking to him and he liked us and we brought him out to Boston and I picked his mom up at the airport and her parents live in St. George and my grandparents lived in St. George and we just totally hit it off. So we started kind of working with Ricky Fowler, which was his name. And uh, by the end of the summer, Ricky decides he's going to sign with Puma. And he is still with Puma, making both himself and that brand a shitload of money. So he was a really good, really, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, camera, um, making them a lot of money. Uh, so he ended up being like a really good summer project. Um, and just, I felt like back, back in my element, back on my game, just feeling really great. But also, I had this back of my mind dream, always, that I wanted to get back to the Olympics, that I wanted to work for the Olympics again. And really, I had all these friends who were following Olympic games around the world, and they were working for each organizing committee, and that just didn't appeal to me. The only place to go was to the US Olympic Committee, and they just never had opportunities open. It was very small, very, very exclusive, and I just did not think that was even a possibility. So I'm in Boston, we've just signed cute little Ricky. He's adorable. He's wearing these hats and orange on Sundays and it's great. But I get a phone call from my friend Heather, who was my manager in Salt Lake at the organizing committee. And she says, I just had lunch with some friends from Colorado Springs and they're trying to find this really specific person to manage team processing for the US Olympic team at the US Olympic Committee. And what they want is someone who's worked on an organizing committee, has uh, experience at a big sports apparel brand, and works in marketing, and OPS oh, also speaks a second language. And I was like, uh, I'm, I'm it. I'm like the only one. I would know anyone else who was that, and it's, I'm, it's just me. I'm the person. <laughs> So I basically wrote a cover letter that was like, it's, yeah, I, it's just me, guys. You, the person you want, it's me. So I got the job, uh, and I moved to Colorado Springs, and I ended up with the US Olympic team for five years managing team processing. And what that is, it's the best job in sports. I worked with Nike and with Ralph Lauren to build the opening and closing ceremony uniforms, the podium uniforms, and all the stuff that all the athletes wear at the Olympics. And then on top of getting to do that, I would actually build a distribution center where every single athlete would come through, pick up their gear, get their pictures taken, hang out before they headed off to the Olympics. So it was crazy fun. Every single athlete on the Vancouver, London, and Sochi Olympic team came through my distribution center and spent a day with us and hung out and joked around. And I just, I mean, I have stories for days about those athletes. It was such a fun job. Um, met a million amazing, ugh, amazing, amazing, interesting people, traveled all over the world. It was, it really was the coolest, coolest job. Um, one quick story because they're always, there's so many fun ones, but when my very first Olympics was Vancouver and typically the athletes would go through with their team. So they'd come in and they'd all go try everything on together. And it was real fun to watch them. But for some reason, Sean White, who, do you guys know who Sean White is? Sometimes I don't know if these are like old athletes. You're like, no, we don't know that guy. But Sean White still seems relevant. So he was coming through. That was his second games. Um, and he had to come by himself for some reason. He was just going to come through alone. So we were trying to set the room and get the volunteers all ready. So I sent Sean and his coach just over to the cafeteria where we were doing lunch. I was like, please wait in there and I'll come grab you when we're ready. So I go over to get Sean. And as I'm approaching the room, there's just like loud music coming out of the room and I open the door. And when I say that Sean and his coach were bouncing off the walls, I'm not kidding. They were bouncing off the walls to some punk rock music, just getting so hyped to come in and go through team processing. It was like if you had written a, a movie scene of what an Olympic snowboarder was doing before he came through team processing, it was exactly the scene that I came upon. It was just like they were in full crazy mode, crazy snowboarder mode. Um, so moments like that over and over and over again throughout uh, that job. It was crazy fun. But in Sochi, so it was in uh, the mountains of Sochi, one of my really close friends who'd been on the snowboard team, training his butt off, makes the team, goes to Sochi, not favored to win a medal at all, 
We're sitting there at snowboard cross, which is this crazy racing, snowboard racing, where they do these flips and jumps, and it's insane. It looks like roller hockey on snowboards. And Alex gets through the first group, and Alex gets through semifinals, and Alex is in finals, and we're all looking. I'm with his mom. We're like, this is not, like, Alex isn't going to win a medal, is he? And he comes across the last jump, and he does some little elbow thing that's legal, and he wins an Olympic medal. And I watch one of my best friends on the planet win an Olympic medal, and then later that day get his Olympic medal in a uniform I worked on in Russia. And I thought, I can't top this. This is it. This is like the coolest thing that's going to happen here. And as we're like bouncing around and watching him, and he's pointing at us, and I have this cute picture of Alex like acknowledging that we're down there. It was like the, one of the greatest moments of my life. But I'll never top this. And also, it's so cool to be the team behind the team, but like watching my friend up there realizing his dreams, it's like, I don't know if this is my ultimate dream or if I should be trying to figure out what my version of the Olympic podium is. So I started sort of going back and what are, what are some dreams that I've had? And one of them was, I had a lot of dreams, guys. <laughs> um, that I always wanted to work for the North Face. I thought that was such a cool brand and they were in San Francisco, which is one of my favorite cities in the whole world. And I had written on a little journal square in like 2005, some things I wanted to do. And one was go to Vancouver, one was work for the Olympics again, one was move to San Francisco and one was work for the North Face. And I had scratched out Vancouver and I had scratched out work for the Olympics. So I had these two left and so I hopped on the North Face website and they had a brand manager position open for fitness and running, which I was like, well, I could do that in my sleep. So at this point in my career, I thought, I'm going to submit this resume. I had a couple of friends who worked at the North Face, but I thought, I'm going to see if my resume at this point will just get me a call on its own, if I can just send this and see if I'm, if I'm far enough along that just my accomplishments will get me in the door. And I got a phone call um, that they wanted to do a screener interview. So then once I did that, I, of course, jumped right into my network called my friend Lindsay, who worked in marketing there, told her I was applying, called my friend Brigham, who worked in product, told him I was applying, and you guys know where this is going. I got that job. <laughs> so I ended up moving from Colorado Springs to, to San Francisco and getting this just like dream job at the North Face. And it was exactly what you would imagine, just all these people who were like, the coolest skiers and adventurers and people who just camped every weekend and did ridiculous, out of control, outdoorsy things. And the job was really, really hard, really hard. It's a big brand, $3 billion brand. And at that point, all these other brands that were supposed to be sports brands were coming into our space. Like Nike was making a puffer jacket and Old Navy was making a puffer jacket. Like we just had competitors that we never had before. And it was a really hard time to be at the brand and people felt a lot of pressure. I met some of the most talented people I've ever met. I got to make a TV commercial. I got to spend millions and millions of dollars on ad campaigns where I could advertise in both shape and glamour at the same time. I didn't have to choose. It was really exciting. Um, it was so fun. I had all these crazy, amazing experiences, but I had a really hard boss. And I just hit a point in my life. I was about to turn 40. It's a real thing. You start questioning what's going on with your life. And I really missed Utah, which I did not expect. I was living in San Francisco in a really cute neighborhood. And I was like, I kind of want to live in Utah again. So um, I started thinking about what that might look like. And some friends at the ski team reached out. And they offered me a job. And the salary was terrible. So I said no. And then some friends who, from some SUU friends, actually, who have a really cool uniform company in Orem offered me a job. And I said, I definitely don't want to live in Orem. No offense to Orem, any of you who might live there, but that just wasn't probably my jam. Uh, as a single woman, did not think that was a place I wanted to be. So uh, I said no to that one. And then on New Year's Day 2016, I was like, guys, I was at lunch with a bunch of girlfriends, like, girls, I got to come back to Utah, but also I have to keep having a rocking career. And unless I work for the jazz and you ladies all have the jobs at the jazz that I would want, like, what am I going to do? And the three of them in unison, like eyes light up, <gasps> Molly, let's call Molly. I was like, okay, who's Molly? <laughs> and why don't I know her? Um, they had this friend and she owned a little agency. She had three partners and they were all kind of leftover Salt Lake 2002 people 
who did all the design work for 2002. And they had a company that now does environmental graphics and branding for uh, professional teams, events, and venues. So at the time, they were working on the NHL All-Star Game. They were working on the Little Caesars Arena where the Detroit Red Wings play. Uh, they had contracts with the college football playoffs. So that seemed like a pretty good place for me to land in Utah. So I called Molly and she was like, yeah, my phone blew up about an hour ago and apparently everyone thinks I should hire you. you guys know where this is going. I got that job. job. Yeah, I did. I did. I got the job. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, got that job. So I moved back to Utah. Have a great time at that job. Um, what are you guys noticing as a trend with all of these jobs? Anybody? You're getting them. Oh, well, I'm getting them. Yeah, there's that. I hate, to, I hate saying that in this day and age because I really have gotten every job I ever applied for, and that just doesn't happen very often. But there's a reason why. Do you know? Uh, it's not about what you know, it's about what you know. There you go. There you go. It is. Networking is a real thing. Now, I will, I will caveat that a little bit, that you do have to like, be good at your job. <laughs> so you do have to know a few things, too. But yes. It is very, very, very important when you hear this ad nauseum from your professors and from on you know, podcasts that you listen to, and if you listen to How I Built This, which you should all be listening to on NPR, it is definitely always a person in your life who makes the biggest, most dramatic opportunities for you. It's someone that you know. It's someone from your network. But here's the thing. That doesn't mean you hop on LinkedIn and you look for a bunch of people who have jobs you wish you had and you spam them with emails. What it means is you start right now, at this point of your life, just being interested in people and getting to know people and hanging on to them. The reason that I still know Mindy and the reason that I still know Janet is because I still care about people and I still reach out to them and we're Facebook friends and we're Instagram friends. I've been holding on to people since before there were social networks to hold on to them when I had to like call them on the phone or write them letters. And it's made a huge difference in every aspect of my life. You guys have heard about the career pieces of my life that that's mattered in, but it's mattered in finding places to live in the big cities that I've moved to. It's mattered in finding people to date. It's mattered in finding opportunities having other opportunities. I'm going to tell you guys something I wasn't planning to tell, but this is kind of a cool moment. And I just feel so I had this nephew who got diagnosed with cancer a couple years ago. It was horrible. Um, he passed away this summer, but I had, he's a huge sports fan, huge, 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 huge. And Donovan Mitchell was his very favorite player. And I have all these friends who work for the jazz. So last spring or last winter, um, he had a break in chemo, he was 10, and we were able to go to a jazz game and go to the practice before and sit right on the front row. And uh, Donovan came over and chatted with us and signed this amazing yearbook for Mo and talked to him and told him he'd win the game for him, which I think all athletes tell little sick kids, but it worked that night. Um, and for one night, it just didn't feel like Mo had cancer. For one night, it felt just really normal. And we talked about Donovan and how awesome he was and all the guys on the team and Mo got to shake their hands and wear the jersey. And that was something that we were able to do because my dear friends made that happen. I didn't even ask. It wasn't something I asked for. It was something that they volunteered to do because they loved me. And we have been friends now for 20 years. And that all started at the, US Olymp or at the Salt Lake Olympics, where those women became my circle. And they took care of us in a moment that really, really mattered. And now, especially that Mo is gone, that night, that player, that game, I will never not be a Donovan Mitchell fan. I don't care where he goes. He could go to the Lakers, and I would still be a fan. <laughs> So that's what a network means. And you have to genuinely be interested in people. I really mean that part. But that doesn't cost you money to network. It doesn't cost you. You don't have to be someone special to network. People love to talk about themselves. People love to feel important. And if you can develop that skill now, and if you can take the opportunities to meet people and to try things and get out of your comfort zone a little bit. I live my entire life outside my comfort zone. I would like to be sitting on my couch watching television all the time. But I don't. I get out. I go do things because that's where you meet people and that's how you meet the people that are going to help you have the experiences that you want to have. 
We only have a few more minutes, but I have one last thing that's super important that I have to tell you, and that is the biggest skill that you can learn. Something that I've told every intern I've ever worked with, something I seriously believe is the best skill a human can have no matter what job you want to have. And I'm going to tell you a quick story about an Olympic behind the scenes moment that you wouldn't hear of and that uh, probably shouldn't tell, but I'm going to do it anyway. So we're in Munich, Russia, or Munich, Germany. <laughs> I know Munich's not in Russia. We did our team processing in Munich for Sochi because for a variety of reasons, we didn't want to try to take a bunch of apparel to Russia and risk not having it get through customs. So we did it in Germany and then we sent our athletes to Russia on charter planes. So the Germans, I don't know if you know this, but they are real sticklers for rules. And um, some of the rules about how much gear you can put on a charter plane had never really been enforced in any other country that we'd been to, but they were really, really serious about it in Germany. So we had made all of our calculations about how much luggage we could get to Russia on the guidelines, and now we were dealing with rules, and then suddenly I had 35 opening ceremony uniforms stuck in Germany that needed to be in Russia. So just real quick, most athletes aren't going to win a gold medal. So what do you think is really, really second place important to them? Do you think it's marching and opening ceremony? Because you would be right. So if I have 35 uniforms in Germany, that means I have 35 athletes that I'm going to have to tell they cannot march an opening ceremony. So as you can imagine, that's not actually something that you can do. You don't actually get to make that phone call and say, sorry, guys, we have your uniforms here. So you just have to sit this one out. So we have two days until the Olympics, and um, Russia's not allowing any more planes in, and we don't have time to ship anything else, and so we are stuck. And um, I pull my little team together, and I tell them the situation, and we start making phone calls. I make a phone call to my friend who works for the organizing committee in Russia, who kind of knows Putin's nephew. And I'm like, do you think you could call him and see if we could get some airspace opened up? <laughs> Just like one extra plane in. And she's like, let me check. So these are the kinds of conversations that are happening behind the scenes at the Olympics. Everybody, like everyone just goes off to their corners and they're, we're all trying to figure things out and, and our travel woman, she's calling every European country to see if maybe they've got a little bit of space. But it's two days before and pretty much everybody's already in Russia because they have to train. So they don't, they go to the games before the games actually start. So getting down to the wire and then Nancy comes bursting in and she's like, I got it. The Dutch waited till the last minute because they were training in Amsterdam. They have a plane, it leaves tomorrow. They're going to send a couple of guys with a box truck. They're going to pick up our gear and they're going to take it on that last plane. So I go wake up the intern. And I'm like, Kyle, get your clothes together. You're going to Amsterdam because you are going to accompany those uniforms because I trust the Dutch, but also someone's got to go with them. And two goofball Dutch guys show up that night in a box truck. They take all our gear and they drive to Amsterdam and the uniforms got there in time. And no one in Russia was the wiser. Um, the reason that I bring this story up is because the people that were in that room with me when we were trying to figure out a solution had been with me for multiple games. I worked on three Olympics, two youth games, and a Pan Am game. So we'd been together many, many times. And the reason I kept bringing them was because when we sat down and I presented the problem, no one was like, oh no, what are we going to do? Everyone was just like, OK, I got three ideas. Let me start working on them. And everybody went to their corners, and everyone started working, and we came up with a solution. Because when you're working a huge world event that has a lot of high stakes, I mean, I wasn't going to tell Ralph Lauren 30 of those uniforms weren't going to show up. They use $20 million a year. You just figure things out. You just do. And that's a thing that anyone can be resourceful. Anybody can develop the ability to be resourceful. Any single one of you can learn how to just figure it out and make it work and make it happen. And I will tell you, I don't believe stereotypes about generations because I think that's sort of BS. Um, I have hired a bazillion millennials and the ones that I have loved have been the ones that will say, yeah, I can figure it out. And the ones that I haven't liked and that I've called millennials are the ones who are like, I don't know if that's possible. I don't want to hear it. I got 35 uniforms to Russia. So you can figure out how to find a fountain pen for the photo shoot. I just feel like you can. You can do it. 
Um, and so I have, have filled my, have always hired and have given recommendations to those folks around me, have taken to the Olympics, people who make things happen, who just get shit done. Sorry, I did it again. Um, who just make things happen and, and, make, and get things done. And again, that is not something that you have to be extra talented to do. That's not something you have to be rich or good looking to do. You don't have to be particularly nice to be resourceful. <laughs> you can be resourceful at any level or, or position in your life. You really can. So I would encourage all of you to do some research into resourcefulness and figure out how to be the person in the room who's like, yeah, I got this. Because if you can always make your boss look really good, it's going to bode well for you. And if you're always the one that people are like, I want you on my team because you make things happen, it's going to bode well for you. And not to be too braggy, that's why I kept getting all of those jobs, is because every single time I'm on someone's team, I get things done and I don't say no and I work really hard and I'm usually super nice. So I've gotten lots of really good opportunities. So I'm going to close just by telling you guys, because I want to leave a few minutes for questions. In 1995, I was folding laundry in my mom's room. And an announcement came on the TV that we had gotten the Olympics for 2002 in Salt Lake. And I remember folding all of my dumb siblings' clothes, and I thought, that would be such a cool thing to be a part of. But it's seven years away, and I'll probably be, I don't know, married and folding clothes for my kids by then. Joke's on me. I still don't have any kids. But um, I just thought, this is so out of reach and so unavailable to me that, that it just seemed like a really ethereal dream. <coughs> And then seven years later, I'm standing on center ice at the Vivint Arena trying to figure out where to put the podium for the gold medalist to stand on. So when I tell you that you can do anything, I really mean it. I am not some special unicorn most, in most ways. I am in some ways. But I'm not some special person with some special talent. I've just been really resourceful and I've worked really hard. And one of my favorite all-time speeches was one that Conan O'Brien gave on his last night hosting the Today Show. And he, it had been his dream job and through some weird shenanigans, it was getting taken away from him. It was his last night and he's trying to kind of be upbeat and he left the audience with this really beautiful speech and at the last, mo the sort of last bit of it, he said, listen, no one in life gets everything that they thought they were gonna get. But if you work really hard and you're kind, amazing things will happen. I promise you, amazing things will happen. And I just have to tell you that I have experienced that over and over and over in my life, that if you work really hard, and that's the very key, you have to work really hard. You're gonna spend some nights at the office too late, and you're gonna spend some weekends working, and you're gonna sometimes feel like, I haven't seen my family in like months. But if you work really hard, and you're kind, you're like good to be around, doors open, amazing things happen. Stuff that you can't conceive of right now. Things I never would have imagined when I was wandering around on this campus 25 years ago will happen. So I want that to be sort of the last little thing that sinks into your heads. Work hard, be kind, amazing things. We have four minutes for questions. Does anyone have one? No? No questions? Just clapping? I like that. <laughs> you have a question. Uh, who is your favorite boss and why? Oh, that is a great question. Um, it's a hard question. <laughs> so I, I have had good bosses and I've had bad bosses. Probably my favorite one uh, was my second boss at the USOC. And part of the reason was because I was in Colorado Springs and he was in New York. So that was cool. <laughs> Um, but he was this amazing, he had worked at the NFL for a long time um, and then he did all the licensing for the NFL and then he ran the Super Bowl. So he had some cool experience. But the best thing about Peter, um, I'm going to get a little choked up because he was so great, was he trusted me and he just let me do my thing. And I had had bosses who were very much down in your business and trying to, you know, trying to sort of be the boss. And Peter just knew that I could do my work. And the best, the best thing he ever did was left me in, Rus in Germany all by myself and went off to Russia. And at the beginning, he just said, you're going to be great. I'm not even worried about it. Here's my, you know, here's my Russian phone number, but like, I don't even expect to hear from you. He was, I, I learned so much from him just by doing 
but watching him do things, not by him trying to cram information down my throat. And he just trusted me and let me do what I wanted to do. And I've tried to do that as a philosophy as well. And it's always so much better if you just hire really smart people and let them do what they, what they do and just give them a little guidance here and there. It's the best kind of team. Anybody else? Yes. Who's your favorite app? <laughs> I'm glad you asked favorite and not least favorite. <laughs> um, gosh, that is a hard one because there were so many really cool ones. But I think the nicest athlete I ever met was Carrie Walsh. Do you know who she is? No, professional volley volleyball. beach volleyball player. Yes, she was. So most of the athletes are actually really, really nice. But Carrie was one of the. She's like a superstar. She's got three gold medals. She's very, very, very talented, and she's like nine feet tall and super gorgeous. And she was thanking the volunteers as she went through team processing. And it just—it's one of those things that just like warms my heart to the very core. And we happened to have a couple people in common. And when I talked to her about that, she just could not have been more like, oh my gosh, no way, you know, like just acting like we were dear long lost best friends. And I was just really impressed that even someone at her level could be so down to earth and so cool. But meeting Kobe and LeBron was pretty cool too. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah, what advice do you have for like senior level marketing students like that want to work for a big brand in the long run? Like where do you recommend they like get started like gaining that experience to get those jobs? That's a great question. So internships are definitely super, super, super important. And I know they're hard to get. <laughs> um, and so one thing that I am going to tell all of you, and we'll see how many of you take me up on this, but you guys are welcome to add me on LinkedIn um, and to look through and see if there are people that I could potentially introduce you to, like be cool about it, but um, <laughs> that would be part of my advice, definitely internships, but also like depending on what area you want to get into, one thing you can do is volunteer for, let's say you want to get into sports. So volunteer for a track and field meet, like try to go to the places where you think you're going to have access to those people and don't be afraid to take people up on uh, offers like that and to ask your professors if they know people like that's the best way to do it. Because honestly, having hired a lot of interns, a lot of resumes go right out the window unless someone says, hey, I know so and so you should take a peek at this resume. That would be my, my best advice right now, but we can chat more after. Um, the other thing I'll let you look at, because Tyler mentioned it, is I do have a Instagram that seems private, but I'd, I'd probably let most of you in if you wanted to. So it's a good, good spot. I, I do like to give sort of different kinds of bits of advice and things there as well. So any other questions? That's it. All right. All right. Let, me, let me jump in. Uh, and. Uh, I want to acknowledge Katie, who took a day off of work to come down here and present really at the Cedar Award. <laughs> oh. Uh, and also acknowledge a couple of firsts for us. This is the fewest glances at the clock that we've had yes. during the talk. <laughs> uh, it's the best shoes we've ever had uh, during the speaker series. <laughs> and it's the first time we're going to have to do an explicit warning. <laughs> <on the video. laughs> My mother will be so proud. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you.